You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Hey, boys and girls. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 1, page 46. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. That's our good friend and confidant, R080T. I think I'm an outer man. Our semi-friend, and actually I don't even know his last name, announcer man. Oh, <laughs> he just said his name. <clears throat> nice one. Today we are presenting Restoration Blues by Stuart Smith. Stuart Smith lives in San Antonio, Texas. He's been writing for a number of years, and Restoration Blues is his first science fiction sale. Special thanks to Danny Cutler from the Truth Seekers podcast and Marie Brennan for lending their voices to today's episode. And today's music is by Frozen Silence. There are links to everyone in the show notes. Restoration Blues by Stuart S. Smith Peter Wilson flinched as the cold fiber optic cable bundle brushed across his bare buttocks. Why are public backup booths always freezing? He wondered. I don't mind having the blood drawn, but why make the clients enter the booth naked? He eased the backup helmet to the right, and the booth's indicator light turned green. At last. Fifteen minutes of jiggling. It didn't take this long the last time. Peter took a deep breath in the frigid air. The booth smelled like bleach. He placed numb feet on the silver metal outlines, shoulder-width apart on the damp floor, and shivered. This is crazy, he thought. I crawled out of a warm bed to spend Saturday morning freezing to death in a public backup booth. He thought of Cynthia, warm and smooth, spooned up against him under the covers of their bed, honey blonde hair brushing his eyelids, the bed covers giving off the musk of last night's sex. He grinned and leaned toward the chamber wall, placing his hands on the damp silver handprints. The booth's first buzzer sounded. Vertigo slammed Peter. A wave of nausea swept over him and he swallowed bile. It wasn't this bad last time. I'll never get used to it. The second buzzer sounded. He pushed back from the wall and unhooked the helmet chin strap. With a metallic click and a pneumatic sigh, the booth door opened. He hung the helmet on its wall hook and stepped out into the warm air of the locker room corridor. This is a pain. If annual backups weren't the law, I wouldn't do it. Ahead of him, silhouetted by the locker room lights at the end of the corridor, an old woman stood, leaning on the aluminum frame of a walker. She was tiny, stooped, dressed in black pants and a heavily embroidered long coat, her black hair lined with gray and gathered in a bun. Who let her in there? She wasn't allowed on the men's side. Who was she? She looked oriental, Chinese maybe. Peter clenched his jaw and stalked down the corridor, eyes front, ignoring the old woman and the fact that he was naked. Ahead of him, the woman peered at him as he approached. Peter? He stopped and looked down at her. It's Cynthia, Peter. Welcome back. It's been 31 years. He scowled at her. Lady, I don't know who you are, but you don't look like my wife. She looked down at the age-spotted hands on the walker frame and grimaced. No, I suppose not. She looked up at him. It's cosmetic, a fashion statement. My constituents expect it. She cocked her head to one side and smiled up at him, revealing teeth the color of old ivory. We made love twice last night, first on the table in the kitchen, and then later in bed. Does that convince you? Peter glared down at her in shocked silence. The head gesture was pure Cynthia. It couldn't be. He crossed his arms, hugging himself. How did you know that? How do you think? She asked, her expression sliding into a sneer. What a stupid question. She turned the walker away from him. I don't have time to stand in a locker room arguing with you. I had them put clothes in locker 101. Get dressed. We're going to lunch. Zinni will be waiting. She pushed the walker toward the door. Peter looked at the locker room. He'd stumbled through it, half asleep on the way in. It seemed bigger. The Des Moines Backup Center locker numbers only went up to 99. He walked up the aisle to locker 101 and opened it. Inside, he found an unbleached muslin caftan with royal blue embroidered cuffs and a pair of brown leather sandals. He stared at the caftan for a moment, one eyebrow raised. 
No underwear? It's out of fashion, the old woman said from near the door. Get dressed. He made it a point to ignore the mirror on the inside of the locker door as he settled the caftan over his head and arms. Everyone looks, just to make sure it wasn't a restore instead of a backup. He slid his feet into the sandals. He pursed his lips and closed the door without looking. He turned away from the locker, stood for a moment, then sighed and opened the door to see his face in the mirror. Peter Wilson stared back at him, but it was a stranger's face. The face had the same sandy hair, but longer. The cheeks were thinner, like he'd lost weight. There was no scar running through his right eyebrow. His stomach clenched into a knot. Do try to hurry, won't you? Peter slammed the locker shut and hurried after the old woman. At the locker room door, four men with shaved heads, dressed in identical black caftans with white cuffs, fell into step with him. Two in front and two behind. At the street, one held the door of a black limo while the other stood facing outward. Peter stepped through the backup center's front entrance, looked up, and stopped. Tall buildings marched up the street on both sides. High above them, a dome stretched as far as he could see. Where are we? He asked. Tribeca Dome, New York City. Stop gawking like a farmer and get in the car. I'm hungry. The car swept away. Peter looked over at the old woman. Yes, I have him. He looks all right. I'm bringing him to lunch. She glanced at Peter. We'll be there in 20 minutes. It is, Cynthia. I've died and been restored. He had a vision of his clone body, shambling and drooling, guided into the backup booth by two attendants, to stand slack-jawed as they placed the helmet on its head. Then the restore, the clone trembling as Peter's personality and memories avalanched into its skull. Peter looked down at his hands and shivered. Sorry, Peter, Cynthia said, turning to him. We use implant phones now, but I'm old-fashioned. I still speak out loud. This clone body of yours has one. Direct retinal projection, too. You'll need to learn to use it. Shouldn't take you more than a week. What happened to me, Sin? She compressed her lips into a straight line, stared out the car window, and answered in a monotone. You died, Peter. On the way home from the backup parlor, you were in a monorail accident. You were in a coma for a long time, and then you died. How long was I in a coma? Cynthia looked down at her hands. They trembled as she passed the palm of one over the back of the other, like she was washing them. She spoke in a voice so low that Peter leaned toward her to hear. A long time. Twenty-seven years. You had brain activity, you were alive, but you never woke up. We tried everything, even surgery. Nothing worked. That would make you fifty now. What's the rest of it? Cynthia looked up at Peter and wet her lips with her tongue. I got... I got involved with someone else while you were in the coma. And? We got married after you died. His name was Giovanni Scarpello. He was your neurosurgeon. There was a child. This Zinni? No, her name was Magda. She died in one of the African pandemics. Pneumonic AIDS, they said. She was a one-lifer, so there was no backup. Zinni is her daughter, my granddaughter. Jesus, Sin, what year is it? It's 2090. You died 31 years ago. Your last backup was in 2032, 58 years ago. No, it wasn't. It was 45 minutes ago. Peter slumped back on the leather seat and closed his eyes. <sighs> What's it like, Peter? Dying and being restored. It's nothing. I went into the backup booth. When I came out, it was 58 years later and my wife was old. It didn't hurt? You weren't disoriented? No, it didn't hurt. But everything's changed. Well, that's good news. He opened his eyes and looked at her. Why? I'm going to die, Peter. I have accumulation syndrome from too many genetic modifications. The doctors can't fix me anymore. It's easier to start over with a fresh body. I'll have euthanasia a week from next Thursday, but I'll be restored from backup the next day. The clone is already waiting for me. I'll be 23 again. But the whole idea? It terrifies me. Cynthia lapsed into a brooding silence, staring out the window as the limo hurtled down a deserted, trash-strewn street. In the distance, a curved black wall blocked their path. As the car approached the base of the wall, Peter could see that it towered over most of the local buildings and disappeared in the distance to the right and left. 
the car slowed and swung onto a ramp built into the side of the wall. At the top of the ramp, the car stopped in front of a restaurant built into the face of the dome. Peter followed Cynthia, sans walker, and her black-clad entourage through the restaurant to a crystal balcony overlooking the ocean. The balcony was a transparent island of light floating in the middle of a storm. Sheets of gray, windblown rain lashed at its walls. Peter peered down, past his sandal-shod feet, at gray, mist-shrouded breakers that thundered against the wall of Tribeca Dome. The wave tops tickled the balcony floor. He heard thunder rumble in the distance and felt the floor vibrate. The balcony held one table. A young, dark-haired woman in a brown leather jumpsuit rose from her seat, embraced Cynthia, and examined Peter. Green eyes, he thought. Oh, he's cute, Grams. I can see why you fell for him. Zinni, this is my ex-husband, Peter Wilson. Peter, this is my granddaughter, Zenobia Irene Naughton. Call me Zinni, Pete. I mean it, Grams. If you're done with him, can I have him? Stop it, Zinni. Don't tease him. He's just been restored. Zinni took the chair next to Peter, and a waiter took their orders. She leaned forward, elbows on the table, and regarded Peter. A sly smile stole across her lips. She put her hand on Peter's arm. Just restored, huh? Bet you've still got the old cohort desynchronization anxiety. Desynchronization anxiety? When you realize that you've lost everyone you've ever known. They've already faced death, or are about to. They can choose when or if to be restored. Your cohort is leaving you, Pete, scattering into the future. Peter felt tightness in his chest. He shivered and gave Cynthia a long, tight-lipped stare. I mean it, Zinni, she said. Aw, Grams, what girl could resist a newly restored clone body? She fixed her gaze on him and moved her palm down his arm to cover the back of his hand. Definitely green eyes, he thought. A virgin clone body, she said. Especially one whose current inhabitant hasn't had sex in 58 years. Zenobia Irene, you're engaged. Cynthia turned to Peter. She's engaged to an important man, the son of an alderman. Grams really is quite the little dynast, Pete. Did she mention she's also an alderman? She represents Chinatown Dome. She's also in charge of the space program for all of New York City. The waiter interrupted them with lunch. Grilled mahi-mahi, served family style. They finished the meal in silence. Peter ate ravenously, while outside the storm pounded the wall below the balcony. When he was done, Peter crossed his knife and fork on the plate, pushed it away, and looked at Cynthia. There are things I need to know, he said. I gather from what you said, we're no longer married. No, the marriage ended when you died. Money? None. We had $300 in the savings account when you were in the train wreck. You now have the basic proletariat allowance, nothing more. Work? None. There hasn't been a flesh and blood computer psychologist in 50 years. A whole new spontaneous machine intelligence has appeared while you were digital. Restoration's a bitch, isn't it, Pete? Shut up, Zinni. Cynthia glared at her. I've arranged a place for you to sleep, Peter. Cynthia slid a plastic chip with an address across the table. I also got you a job, starting in two weeks. The details are on the chit. Your new body is post-human. Exercise its features before the job starts. You'll need them. That's it, then? That's it. Look at it from my point of view, Peter. You are someone who I was married to for 18 months, almost 60 years ago. I'm sorry the way things turned out for you, but I'm not the same person you married. Cynthia rose and nodded her head. Good luck and goodbye. The doorman will call you a cab. It's prepaid. Come, Zinni. Zinni followed her grandmother out of the restaurant. At the front door, she looked over her shoulder and blew him a kiss. Peter looked at the address on the chit and realized his hand was shaking again. He pocketed the chit and went to search for the doorman. The cab dropped Peter at a warehouse in Chinatown Dome. The address Cynthia had given him at lunch was a dilapidated pile of graying red brick in the middle of the block. A colorful assortment of people flowed in and out through the cavernous loading dock doorway. A peeling sign painted on the door announced in yellow block letters, Humans Only. He stopped two steps inside the door and surveyed the gutted interior. The ceiling was a dirty skylight twelve stories above the floor. The far side was hidden in gloom. On both sides of a central corridor, the room was stacked floor to ceiling with yellow canisters five feet in diameter and ten feet in length. The ends of the canisters were rounded, each with a black painted number and a latching mechanism. Metal scaffolding on both sides of the aisle provided access to the canisters. The floor of the building was a noisy bazaar a hundred meters wide. 
twisted paths led to the base of the canister pile, each lined with hawkers in tiny stalls, calling out their wares. Down one path, he saw clothing and shoes. Food sellers clogged another path. He smelled charcoal, cooking meat, and an undercurrent of boiled cabbage. Four men hunched over a dice game near one side of the door. On the other side, a musician played an accordion and danced, his hat upturned on the floor. Peter looked at the chit in his hand. Thirteenth tier, number twenty-six, he read. At least it looked like they had doors that locked. He dove into the bazaar down a path lined with costume jewelry sellers. At the thirteenth tier canister, he slid the chit into a slot in the door. It opened upward and a light came on. Most of the canister was bed, with a small wash basin. No toilet. He remembered seeing signs for showers and toilets near the building doorway. At least the canister had a TV that doubled as an information terminal from the looks of the keyboard. He turned from the open door and looked down at the ground floor bazaar. He felt tired, as if the crushing weight of all the years he'd missed had settled on his shoulders. Everyone I ever knew or loved is gone, he thought. Either they're dead or so changed I wouldn't know them anymore. Sin and I will never have children. Sin and I aren't even together. All the time I spent in college was a waste. He felt tears on his cheeks. All the plans he'd made, none of it meant a thing. He squeezed the scaffold railing. Here he was in a New York City he didn't even recognize. How was he going to survive? It would be so simple to end it now. Up and over the rail and it's done. He stood, gripping the rail, sobbing, rocking between his toes and heels, his body trembling. Well, he thought at last, at least one advantage of being desynchronized is that there's no one left to see me standing here crying. <laughs> he laughed in spite of himself, then wiped his eyes on his sleeve. He released the railing and stood there for a long time, looking down into the bazaar, alternately laughing and crying at the absurdity of it all, and at the pain. When the tears stopped, he wiped his eyes on his sleeve a final time, took a deep, sobbing breath, and sighed. I have to survive, he thought. Survive first, grieve later. He glanced around at row after row of yellow canisters, then crawled into his own canister and locked it. Peter snapped awake from a sweat-soaked nightmare. He was being crushed by a giant snake. It was wrapped around his neck and was banging his head against a metal door. Someone was pounding on the end of his metal canister. He groped in the dark for the door latch. Hello, Pete. You look like death warmed over. Go on a bender last night? Peter blinked up at Zinni smiling down at him and shook his head to clear it. No, I worked late. Didn't get the shop closed until three this morning. I'm still half asleep. Ah, just the way I like my men. Groggy and naked. Peter felt his cheeks go warm. He snatched a clean caftan and pulled it over his head, then searched for his sandals under the bed. Worked late? You got a job, Pete? I'm impressed. No job. I own it. I've got three noodle stands in the building. This one stays open late. Peter slid into his sandals, stood up outside the door, and stretched. What brings you here, Zinni? Did you say you owned a noodle stand? No, I own three of them. It's only been a week. How'd you do it? Got a job sweeping out hawker stalls. There's always a dice game going on here somewhere. I paid for my college tuition shooting dice. Locals aren't real good at craps. Interesting. She glanced over the railing at the bazaar 13 levels below. <laughs> nice of Grams to get you a canister so far up. She looked back at him. 30% of people commit suicide within a week of restoration. They don't restore suicides. I was just glad to see you alive, but already you're an entrepreneur. She turned back to him and slid her arm inside his. Look, I came to buy you breakfast and seduce you. Peter snorted. I'm flattered, but exhausted. I'll take you up on breakfast. The sex will have to wait. Who said anything about sex? Sidney displayed a wicked grin. I've got a different kind of seduction in mind. Most of the stalls were closed this early in the morning, but they found an open sushi bar and ate at an outside stand-up table. Breakfast was tilapia chunks and rice balls, washed down with green tea served in paper cups. What do you know about spec, Pete? The speculation? When someone builds a house without a buyer hoping to sell it at a profit? 
No, spec is in specification, job specifications for genetically engineered humans. I didn't know it existed until now. He popped a rice ball into his mouth. Most of it occurred after you went digital. Hold out your arm. He held out his arm. Zinni grabbed his wrist with both hands and twisted each hand in an opposite direction. Peter yelped and jerked ah, his arm free. Are you trying to tear all the hair off my forearm? Look at your arm. Peter looked. A smooth black surface covered his arm from the wrist to the elbow. He poked the surface with his finger. It was hard. What is it? What'd you do? It's a carapace, like an insect. You could drive a nail into wood with that arm and never feel it. The bulk of the population has been re-engineered to the basic proletarian spec. You're quite different. How? Your clone was re-engineered to space crew spec. It's rare and expensive. The carapace is part of it. If you suffer sudden decompression, it covers your body, complete with transparent eye coverings and five minutes of air to breathe. There are other things, too. She poured a handful of transparent crystals the size of sugar cubes onto the table next to her tea. These are your homework. They're holographic cubes. There's a slot for them in your canister's terminal. They contain all the information on your modifications, plus exercises to train you in their use. Peter took a sip of his tea and burned his tongue. Gah! If the modifications are so rare and expensive, how did I get them with $300 in the bank? Oh, you paid for them. You're indentured to the captain of the Mars-run spaceship Alamogordo for the next nine years. Enough time for two trips out and back. What? Peter had been slouched over the table. Now he stood rigid, staring transfixed at the crystals as if they were a ball of poisonous snakes. I didn't sign up for anything like that. You didn't have to. Graham signed you up. She went to court and became your legal guardian six months after your accident. Sidney rolled a piece of fish in a rice ball and popped it into her mouth. But why this? Why now? I think she did it for love. And for politics, of course. She has one weakness, my grandfather Giovanni. He was a brilliant surgeon, but always cold and distant to my mother and me. Mom said he was jealous, with a vicious temper. She told me that Giovanni and Grams fought constantly. Regardless, he died a year ago, and now Grams has a problem. A marriage ends when a spouse dies. If the dead spouse doesn't leave any instructions, the survivor chooses when to have the dead person restored. Peter frowned. That's cute. There weren't many restoration laws yet when, when I had my last backup. There is, however, a statute of limitations, Sidney continued. The government steps in after 30 years. Some couples die together, are restored together, and remarry. It's also common for the couple to split up after the restoration. If Grams had died, her guardianship of you ends, and you would have been restored immediately. The last thing she wants is to have a freshly restored ex-husband around when she herself is restored to age 23, and trying to re-snag her other, jealous ex-husband. Plus, Giovanni is Italian, and there are a lot of Italian voters left in Chinatown Dome. Peter shook his head in confusion. So she makes me a slave for nine years? You got it. You were more dangerous to her dead than alive, because she couldn't control the time of your restoration. As an indentured space crewman, you're out of the way. I told you she was in charge of New York's space program. It was easy for her to arrange. Cindy took a sip of her tea. I won't go, Peter said. Slavery is illegal. No, it isn't. The cities have all the power these days. The aldermen pass any laws they like. If you refuse to go, they'll arrest you and take you to your ship in leg irons. Peter was silent, looking over her shoulder, turning the alternatives over in his mind. There had to be a way out. But he couldn't see it. Guess I better sell the noodle stands, he said at last. It could be worse. I don't see how. You know what a slow boat is? No. The scientists got scared after the big melt took out Antarctica and raised the ocean level. In each of the last 15 years, we've launched one small spaceship toward a different sun-like star with known planets. They each carry a complete copy of all of Earth's backups. They'll take thousands of years to reach their destination and hatch out a new version of humanity. I don't know if it'd be all that bad. Peter finished his tea. It'd be a great adventure. Yeah? She grinned. Well, study your cubes. I'll be back to check on you. She crushed the waste paper from the meal into her paper cup, arched it into a trash can, and turned to go. Zinni? She turned. Have I been seduced yet? She laughed and kissed him, a quick brush of her lips on his cheek, and whispered in his ear. The most successful seduction is one you don't realize has happened, she said. And then she was gone, walking down the lane of closed shops. 
At the building front door, she turned and waved to him. He watched her go and waved to her when she reached the door. He continued to stand there for several minutes, inhaling the faint scent of sandalwood perfume and feeling the warm brush of her lips on his cheek. Peter Wilson sat in full lotus position on the scaffold in front of his canister. Mind clear, he thought. Carefully slow the heart rate to 40 beats per minute. The words formed in his mind. You look awfully serene for an indentured space crewman. Hello, Zinni, he replied. Where are you? Wow, Canister Boy's figured out how to use his implant phone. Close your eyes. Why? Just close them. Now. Peter closed his eyes. She brushed his shoulders as she stepped out from behind him and curled up in his lap with her arms around his neck. He slid his arms around her and held her for a moment, feeling her warmth and inhaling her scent. He opened his eyes. Hello, sailor, she said. Did you miss me? He kissed her, a slow, lingering kiss. Zinni opened her eyes and smiled up at Peter. She ran the back of her hand down his cheek. You're a great kisser, Pete. No wonder Graham's married you. Peter stifled a chuckle. Zinni, you're engaged to marry an alderman's son. Oh, that? Saul Weissman is an old and dear friend. He is one of the sweetest men I know, and so are all of the men he dates. He's flown air cover for me with Graham's for the last three years. She wants to arrange a political marriage for me, like this was the 12th century. But she's getting suspicious. That's what the fight at the restaurant was about. She stood and pulled him to his feet. Let's walk for a while. He followed her down the scaffold stairs and into the bazaar. Today, the hawkers were playing klezmer music, accompanied by a steel drum band. She took his hand. As of yesterday, Graham's is digital. She left instructions that I am in sole charge of both her and Giovanni's restoration. She wanted to be restored today, but I'm going to wait a while. I haven't felt this free in years. She stopped and put her hands around his neck. Now kiss me again. I liked it. He kissed her, longer and slower than before. He could feel her heart beating. She took his hand again, and they continued their stroll through the bazaar. I'll miss you when you ship out, Pete. Are you ready to go to your ship? I'm not going on the Alamo Gordo. She stopped and looked up at him, an enigmatic smile on her face. What will you do? It was on those hollow cubes you gave me. The next deep space ship out, the Origami, isn't a slow boat. It's the first true starship. Once it gets far enough away from Earth, it bends space. Transit time to another solar system is very short. I've signed on as part of the crew. What about the indenture? They need a space spec crew, but not enough people have signed up, so they're desperate. They've offered to pay off the crew's debts if they'll go. And how long would you be gone? The enigmatic smile had turned into a grin. Two years round trip, starting in 20 months. Most of that time is getting far enough away from Earth so they can bend space without a catastrophe. They emerged from the bazaar and stopped next to the warehouse door. So that gets you off the hook for the indenture? Already done. I'll sublet the noodle shops while I'm gone. Zinni chuckled and smiled up at him. What's so funny? I was thinking of the expression on Graham's face when she hears you got out of your indenture. Yeah, that should be funny. You don't know the half of it. Watch. She balled her fist and swung hard against the metal of the warehouse doorway and held it up three inches from his nose. The shiny blackness oozed out of her skin and covered her whole hand to the wrist. Graham's is a powerful person, but I'm not going to have an arranged marriage. I've been on Origami's crew list hiding under a false name for two years. It's the only way I could think of to get out from under. He laughed and took her arm. <laughs> Together, they strolled out the warehouse door. Peter leaned against the wall of the locker room corridor, arms folded across his chest. Smells like old sweat socks, he thought. This is taking too long. He glanced at Zinni, who leaned against the opposite wall, hands thrust deep into the hip pockets of her black leather pants, staring at the floor. Stuffing 81 years of life experience into a 23-year-old body takes time, but this is ridiculous. At the end of the corridor, the booth door clicked and opened with a pneumatic sigh. Cynthia stepped naked through the door, smoothing back her long blonde hair. Peter gasped at the sight of her. He felt his face grow warm and the beginnings of an erection. Angry with himself, he set his jaw and straightened, squaring his shoulders. Zinni stepped next to him and linked her arm through his... Cynthia flinched when she recognized them. 
that crossed her arms below her breasts, hugging herself. Peter? Zinni? She said, a slight frown stealing over her lips, eyes searching for someone else. Welcome back, Sin, Peter said. What's he doing here, Zinni? He should be... He should be at work by now. You mean I should be cleaning toilets halfway to Mars? Sorry, it didn't happen that way. You've screwed things up, haven't you, Zinni? Cynthia's face flushed and she took a step forward. Zenobia, Irene, if you've loused this up, so help me, I'll strangle you. She dropped her arms to her sides and balled her hands into fists. So help me, I will. Where's Giovanni? He was supposed to be here. There was a problem, Grams. Zinni squeezed Peter's arm and looked at the floor. There were transcription errors all through his backups. It took quite a while to find one good enough to restore. He's all right, though, isn't he? He was restored? Tell me he was restored. Giovanni's all right, but he's not coming, Sin, Peter said. Shut up, Peter. Tell me what happened, Zinni. Zinni dropped Peter's arm and straightened, facing her grandmother, face flushed. You want to know, Grams? All right, I'll tell you. We eventually did find a good backup for him. He was restored as a 23-year-old, just like you wanted. But once he was restored, he left. Cynthia took a step back. As if she had received a physical blow, the color drained from her face. He told me that you were a conniving old crone, Zinni said, taking a step toward Cynthia. He said he didn't want to have anything more to do with you. He said he was going to find someplace warm and lay on the beach for a year. I don't believe you. Cynthia's face flushed, her eyes filled with tears. He wouldn't do that. He wouldn't do that to me. He wouldn't. I'm not a crone. It took months, Sin. He was restored yesterday and left immediately. Damn it, Peter. This is your fault. Cynthia's face flushed again. She shook her finger in Peter's face. I should have never had you restored. This happened because you seduced my granddaughter. I'll get you for this. You won't have a chance, Grams. Peter and I are leaving tomorrow. We're crew members. On the origami. Cynthia gave Zinni a hard, poisonous stare. I'm sorry, Sin, Peter said. You'll be all alone. So you think that's it then? She asked, her voice rising. We'll see about that. She stamped her foot. I can still stop you, and I will. There is one more thing, Grams, Zinni said with a slight smile, and she stuffed her hands back into her pants pockets. I thought you might react this way, so I took some precautions while we were trying to restore Giovanni. Look at your foot. Cynthia looked down. Her leg from toes to knee was covered in a hard black carapace. She looked up at Zinni, pure terror in her eyes. Peter asked them to put some clothes in a locker for you, Grams. Number 101. The Alamogordo's sister ship, the Eniwa Talk, is about to break orbit for Mars. They've got a crew slot ready for you, so you can pay off the cost of bringing your new clone body up to space crew spec. You're already late in reporting aboard. The marshals are waiting for you outside. I told them you'd probably resist arrest. She turned, without saying goodbye, and walked toward the door. Peter followed her. At the door, she turned, as if she'd forgotten something, and grinned at her grandmother. Oh, and I see why you married him, Grams. He's a great kisser. Author's Note I wrote Restoration Blues in 2003 after visiting my son in Brooklyn. I got to wondering what changes the city would undergo if global warming really got going. At the same time, I was fascinated by the idea of reducing the state of a human mind to a bunch of ones and zeros, and then restoring it into another body. I got to thinking of all the little detail things that could go wrong, both technically and socially in that scenario. Restoration Blues is the result of that speculation. Alright, thanks for listening to that story. I hope you enjoyed it. Someday, big someday. I did enjoy it. This was another one of those that I read before you and uh, sent you an email full of praise and big words that I can't actually say when I'm speaking, but when I'm writing, I use all the time. And sometimes you even use them correctly. Thank you. Yeah, it was a good story. I really enjoyed it. Only so often do we do some real science fiction Wait, was this real science fiction? Because I equate real science fiction with boring stuff. <laughs> now that, I think that would be called hard science fiction. Hard to get through. <laughs> like a legitimate science fiction story, if you know what I mean. Something that's set in the future with spaceships and the like. 
This one I think you can definitely call sci-fi, and you can't really call it anything else. I call it fun, Big. Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> At the top of the hour, we're going to have the brand new track by Hootie and the Blowfish. It's not available on Cracked Rear View, apparently. <sighs> that was the sound of you grunting. <laughs> Make it stop. I, you know, I'm usually afraid of science fiction, I'll be honest. It's not something I write tremendously well. It's probably not something I understand. How's that? But uh, I understood this story. It really struck me as, as humorous and interesting, believable in a the way society is going and the way people actually behave sort of way. And uh, Chalupa. Do you have something to say about today's episode? Drop by our website at doonsteef.com and leave a comment. Okay, so if I gave you the option right now, to transfer your consciousness into yourself when you were 22. Peak physical condition. Were, wait, were you fat yet at 22? No, I wasn't quite. Okay, 22. Thanks. You'd not yet developed any back hair or that disgusting mole that seems to be moving down your... Oh, that's a spider. I, a big? Just right? Brush ah, it. Ah, brush ah, it. Ah, oh, did I get it? Gross. You got it. Yeah, I see, I would have brushed it off, but you smashed it. Just leave it there. It's actually improving your looks. Let me start over. The little man comes to you. I don't know why he's a little man, but he... Because it's a fantasy. And he's a fantasy, Mr. Rock. That's right. So the, the guy comes to you and he says, right now, you can be 22 again. I'm trying to think what strings would possibly be attached. Yeah, I was going to say, you've got to find a reason for me to say no, because so far there isn't one. If okay. it takes my consciousness from now and just puts it in there, then why the heck not? Okay, the 30-something version of you will be sent off to the spice mines of Kessel <laughs> to do slave labor until he keels over. Okay. <laughs> oh. At least you're giving me something. Yeah. So, uh, no. No consequences. You just get to be young again. Okay, the, the, the only caveat is you can never ask what happened to your 30-something self. Just forget about it. Well, why would you want to know anyway? What do you think? Hmm, that sounds pretty effed up. What? Because I... <laughs> you know, if you don't get to ask that something bad is happening, they're chopping him up and using him for uh, dog food or something like that. They've stopped bothering with chopping up horses that they use their hooves for glue, and now they're just using people. Elmer's glue is painful! <laughs> Ah, right. But, uh, yeah, you know, that makes me think of that story by uh, Orson Scott Card. I think you read that as well, the one Fat Farm. Oh, dude, I love that story. Recap that for the people who may not have read uh, Fat Farm. It's in his big short story collection. It came out in 89, 90, somewhere. Something like that, yeah. It's uh, basically just about a man who indulges completely in food, and uh, he becomes this monstrously disgusting fat guy after indulging all this time. And then he gets to go to a office like basically a plastic surgeon or something except for instead of having plastic surgery done he just gets a new body they basically transfer his consciousness into a younger skinnier version of him and then he walks away and oh that's right and when he's become ridiculously fat again he comes back yep, he just comes back and does it again and again and uh, he doesn't know what happens to the fat self of him and, and he doesn't care but in the uh, process of the story we, instead of following the new young skinny guy, follow the fat guy and find out where he goes. And, uh, yeah, it's not good. I, You know, I haven't read all of Card's fiction, but I, I read that whole short story collection uh -huh. from beginning to end. And that's how it, that has to be his darkest story. Did it upset you the way that it did to me? Fat Farm? Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was pretty dark. This is a less sinister version of that, but it is something to think about. What what if you were given the option of being young again and living your whole life and then, woohoo, I get to be the age you are now again? Well, <laughs> <laughs> the younger age than me? I don't know. It, yeah, it's kind of interesting. People, you know, they they talk a lot about scientific experiments that they're doing to try and prevent aging. They're trying to find that aging thing in the in body's cells and turn that fuse off so that the body doesn't get old. You know, we, we stay young to a certain point, and then all of a sudden we start heading downhill. It's it's kind of like that episode of The Dollhouse that we talked about where uh, the lady who dies, they have a copy of her consciousness that they drop into the doll to uh, 
she gets to go and investigate her own murder and it's it's similar to that you know, these people go they get their consciousness uh copied every now and then so that uh if they get hit by a bus or whatever you know they can just put them back into the next body so it's a really interesting concept that episode surprised me because i expected the woman who was not loved because she was hard to live with and selfish and stuff like that I expected her to bargain at the end to say, you know, what would it cost or or just to run, you know what I mean, to flee with that body. And they didn't go that way, which surprised the hell out of me that she fulfilled her contract and got to say goodbye to everybody and then said, okay, and she went to sleep. Did I fall asleep for a little while? Should I go now? If you like. <laughs> Did I get that right? I think so. <laughs> cool. I... I am at an age where a lot of the people that I went to school with or grew up with or whatever have – they've started that decline. And, you know, lots of people that were so hot. She was so hot in high school or whatever. Some of them have aged gracefully. Some of them look better now than they did. But not all. One girl in particular that was just so ridiculously beautiful – and gosh, I don't know how to say this without sounding a little bit like an a-hole. So forgive me for sounding a little bit like one. Or a lot. But uh, it's sad to see her sometimes now. I would probably rather remember her as just so stunningly beautiful. She's gotten really, really, really thin. And that has helped the age show. Mm. But it's just one of those things where it's like, wow, in just a few years. No time at all, really. Age has caught up with her and you and me, and it's going to catch up with everybody. And I think about what if I were somebody that made my living from my looks? What if I were an actress or a model? For once, I'm almost glad not to be one of the beautiful people. Because imagine how awful that would be to have that start to slip away. That you used to be able to walk into a mall and know that every man's eyes were on you. And maybe that would be annoying. I don't know. I, and some days probably is annoying, but it not was every annoying day. annoying when I would walk into the mall and all the men would look at me. I just felt uncomfortable. If you would wear less tight pants. Uh, well, there's that. But if you got it, flaunt it. But okay, but that, that girl that I mentioned, I went to places with her a couple of times. And I remember looking around and seeing people's eyes on her and saying, everybody here is jealous of me. They don't know if we're boyfriend <laughs> and girlfriend. You know what I mean? Right. They only know, hey, this guy is with this really hot girl. So just by proxy, I got a little bit, just a little bit of that thrill. Now, I can't imagine what it's really like for a hot chick. I don't know how you could. I'm sure it gets really tiring or it gets scary or it gets awful or you feel exploited, et cetera, et cetera. But regardless of how awful it is, how much more awful is it the day <laughs> that they don't stops. look, that they're there looking past you or they glance at you and think, oh, she, oh, no. And then they look away. Oh, geez. Imagine that. Some kid checks you out and then looks away. Oh, uh, she's old. And you mentioned <laughs> Meg Ryan. When I was in high school, Meg Ryan was so beautiful and young and she was America's sweetheart or, or one of them. And we were talking the other day about when did she – hit the wall, as ugly a phrase as that is. And we were talking about, well, the, the real Telltale movie was when that In the Cut came out. And she had all the work done on her mouth and her cheekbones. And it just was like, oh, no. Yeah, you looked at her and said, wait, I thought Meg Ryan was in this. Who is that? It looked like that really bad old age makeup that you'd see and that you still see. <laughs> Yeah. In movies and that work, because they can't winnow away at somebody's face, they have to build up. And so, of course, the lips get real big and get built up on the cheeks and all that stuff. And I imagine with CG technology, you can make people legitimately look old. Have, has anybody done that? The way that they did with Aaron Eckhart's face in Dark Knight where they what took away. Benjamin Button? Was it oh, all CG? Excellent. Perfect. Perfect example where they took... Brad, Brad Pitt. Pitt's face and aged it to a hundred. And that was maybe not perfect. You could tell that something was off most of the time. But when it came time to actually play himself and they did that with the CG, 
that was pretty remarkable. It was kind of the opposite of what we talked about with X-Men. They did a pretty darn good job of making him look really young when it got to the point where he was still him, but he was much younger. It was weird. It seemed almost like, yeah, this was Brad Pitt from Thelma and Louise or something instead of now. Was that makeup or was that CG, do you suppose? I don't know. Because they did it with Kate Blanchett as well. I mean, who looks great, however <laughs> right. old she is. But somehow, like all whatever wrinkles or lines in her face that have appeared were gone. And I wondered if it was just makeup or if there was some kind of CG on that. Is that on DVD? It is, yeah. I guess we could watch the making of and find out. Yeah. I actually just saw it the other day for the first time. Oh, well. I found it to be about an hour too long, unfortunately. Did you think it that is way? long? I know that you liked it, you said. I liked it, but I was distressed by how Forrest Gump it was. And then when I went home and found out that Eric Roth had written Forrest Gump, I was just pissed off. Uh, Yeah, it just seemed like it just kept going and going. And I was just like, this needed to end like about now, but it's still got a while to go because he's still not very young. Back on topic, guys. But even not being a hot chick, I feel nostalgic a lot of times. And I always wish that I could go back to times when I approximated happiness or when I had the whole world in front of me and could have done yeah. this or done that. or Sometimes you wish you could go back to when you were a teenager or when you were in high school, but still have the life lessons that you've had now. So you don't see things through those myopic glasses that teenagers just look at everything with and everything's the end of the world and high school is be all end all of everything and it's only four years of their stupid useless lives and they've got 80 to go after that and it's just an interesting thing it would be nice to have some perspective as well as youth but uh, i guess that's just not the way it works did you see the zach efron movie you know i haven't okay so it's matthew perry Mm -hmm. however old he is and then somehow becomes 17 again, hence the title. Uh, But he retains Matthew Perry's intellect and personality and memories and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So does he go out and nail the cheerleader or does he try and win his wife back as a 17-year-old? I said I haven't seen it. Can you just make up an ending? So we don't have to see it. I mean, it's got Zac Efron in it, for goodness sake. Of course he nailed the cheerleader. What the frick? Okay. Well, I thought that it was that. Is that one movie that you cried at? Remember? We were like, oh, I can't believe he nailed the cheerleader so hard. That that was you. Oh, that's right. <laughs> it's a universal theme. I guess everybody, unless they get killed young, ages and sees every time I look in the mirror, all these lines in my face getting clearer. <laughs> the past is gone. Warning: Today's episode contains singing. It's. It sucks. It's something I've started to discover. And uh, I suppose everybody has thought about, I wish I could be 16 again, or or what if. The stories that are like that really resonate with me. I've never really seen one like this, but it's certainly believable that people would do it again and again. And Yeah, as long as you could afford it. It's basically uh, immortality. Did you read Anne Rice's interview with the vampire? I have. Well, one of the main characters is this little girl, Claudia, who is bitten by a vampire and becomes a vampire when she's eight or nine years old. And the years go by and her mind matures, but her body stays nine years old. And she resents the hell out of the vampire who made her and begins to resent the other vampires. And her intellect grows and she becomes crueler and and more cold and hateful than the other vampires and uses that to seduce tons of people into being eaten by her and the main character louis looks at her as as this is a monster that i have helped create and uh, imagine if you were stuck as a child forever like she is and you never get to experience the things that adults do or uh, do you remember when you'd be in a store or you'd be somewhere and you would try and get the attention of the guy behind the counter or ask somebody and they would just ignore you (laughs) and i would hate that so much when i was 11 or 12 and small for my age so of course i looked like i was seven or eight and i'd be like i have money i want to buy something and you were ignoring me and it was powerless and just ooh, i remember just hating that i've been reading the series of unfortunate events 
to my kids recently, and it's just funny. That whole story, like all the things happen in that story because the guy, Mr. Poe, who was supposed to be, I guess, the executor of their estate or whatever, who keeps assigning them to new guardians, they're always like coming, trying to tell him something, you know, oh, it's Count Olaf in disguise. And Mr. Poe, of course, always ignores what they've discovered. And they're just children, so they couldn't know. And yeah, he, he always treats it that way. It's funny that you talk about that vampire kid, because <laughs> sadly, it makes me think of baby Herman from... <laughs> For Roger, Roger Rabbit, Rabbit, where he has that line where he says, I got a 50-year-old lust and a two-year-old dink or something. I don't know, but it just, can you imagine being a guy that's... Wow, my stogie! <laughs> a guy that's stuck at a baby forever. At least the girl was nine years old. Could all, be worse. All right, you're right. That is worse. <laughs> okay, one other thing. Silly, stupid, off-topic, but I'm going to leave it in. I always think, wouldn't it have been cool if somebody had cast Gary Coleman in a, a TV series or a, a movie of the week kind of thing where they'd come back year after year after year, where either he's like Michael Landon, he's an angel, or he is a vampire, or he is a Highlander, or he is some kind of unaging eternal thing. And he's around all these other characters that could come back year after year. And we see, like, his little brother get older than him and, and age and his parents get old and all that stuff. And used to his advantage this disadvantage that he has been given in life. Do something where it's unique. I mean, nobody else but Gary Coleman or someone else in his situation Lewis. could have done this. I don't know. Apparently, he's kind of volatile, and if I ever ran into him, I, I, I wouldn't dare broach the subject with him. But if somebody with foresight had thought about something like that, and you know how there are certain actors, like Peter Falk played Columbo for like 30 years, or people who keep doing TV movies or coming back, or... Heck, you could have used Michael J. Fox. That guy never grew past five foot tall, I don't think. He could have played the, the same age for about 30 years. That's true. He was 30 when he did Back to the Future 3 playing a 17-year-old. So, wow. I guess that would have worked, but Michael J. Fox has other problems that would have prevented that. Well, from eventually, but still. Anyway, that, that, maybe that's just stupid and that's me. What do they call that? Talking? Yeah, they, I think they call it talking. Your world is strange and confusing to me, but uh, I always thought, what a perfect opportunity to play some character like that. Uh, you know, like Nancy Cartwright, who does Bart Simpson's voice, and how she's been a 10-year-old boy <laughs> for 20-something years now. These animated characters are immortal. Yeah, that's a cool thing about that. You know, they could make a Cinderella 2. Cinderella hasn't gotten any older. Maybe they should try that. What do you think? Uh, uh, sadly, I believe they made a Cinderella 2 and 3. Oh, hell no. Those were the dark times. <laughs> Before John Lasseter. <laughs> Anyhow, I guess I had something to say about this story. Thank you, Stuart, for sending that. Send us something else, if you don't mind. Yeah, it was good stuff. Thanks a lot. If you'd like to submit your story to the Doonstief, please visit our website at www.doonstief.com. And check out our submission guidelines. Big, how do you decide when you're editing an episode just how many sound effects to shove in there? Because it seems like in this one, in Restoration Blues, there are fewer than normal. It, am I wrong in thinking that? I made a conscious decision to do that with this episode. For a long time, I've been steadily increasing and increasing and overdoing it and yeah well what was the one where it's just like oh book scouts <laughs> holy moly man there were a lot of sound effects on that yeah sometimes it makes sense a sound effect that is mentioned in the story i will try and find something to go along with that but i've gotten to the point where anything that i would try and find a sound effect for you know a person wakes up and i would find a sound effect <laughs> yeah Book Scouts, you know, I was finding sound effects for someone looking through books. So I'd get a sound effect of someone pulling a book off a shelf and then someone putting a book back on the shelf. I figured I was probably overdoing it a little bit. Well, also, um, I noticed that you've got a lot of white hairs growing into your... <laughs> yeah. So I, I, that's your second clue. Maybe I wasn't overdoing it, though. I don't know. I, I figured that we'd give the listeners a chance to chime in on this and tell me what they think. Because, you know, 
first of all, I really enjoy putting in sound effects. I have a really good time creating an audio painting or it's almost like writing a story to me or something like that. It's fun to put all this stuff together and then be like, yeah, check this out. Listen to this. Doesn't this sound cool? Yeah, you're like my buddy Matt showing off his new bong to me. And he's like, <laughs> oh, you'll never guess. It's shaped like a cactus, man. Not <laughs> as impressive as maybe the sound of projectile vomiting that you put in that last episode. Yeah, that was a fun. I actually had to make that sound effect with some... That was you. Some refried beans. Oh. <laughs> but... <laughs> But, uh, yeah, you know, I have a good time doing it, but it also makes it take longer. It does take a lot more work to put all that kind of stuff together. The sound of someone looking through a box of books is probably not that important in the overall scheme of things. And for me to spend a half an hour on it, you know. So that's when you said to yourself, the line must be drawn here, <laughs> here and no further. Well, I thought I would, with this one, throttle it back a little bit and just put in the sounds that are necessary to the story and i still laid in the background bed you know like the birds chirping or the whatever the sound might be of the background but you know every little incidental sound i didn't necessarily go after and try and find a sound that went with that so i'm curious to know if people notice the difference if they care if the reason they listen to the dune steve is because they love the way i paint pictures with sounds or if they just like the stories and they don't even notice any of the sound effects or if they listen in a loud environment and can't hear anything but the narrator anyways. I don't know. I'm I'm curious to find out if, if it's time well spent or well, time see, wasted. I'm editing an episode right now and I, I just – I don't think I would put in even the birds chirping and stuff that you mentioned, the bed. Uh -huh. There are a couple of explicit references to a character hearing this sound. And so, of course, I feel like I've got to put those in. But some podcasters – or readers or whatever we would call what we do wouldn't even do that. Mm -hmm. They would just read the story right. and feel no need for sound effects. I wonder what you said about, you know, some people only hear the narrator anyway. Do they notice though when those sound effects are suddenly not there? Would they notice if Tom woke up hearing a cry in the distance and there wasn't a cry? You know, that maybe that's not a question we can answer. Maybe well, we're too I close to it. I don't think it is a question that we can answer. But yeah, I'd like to hear what the listeners think. A little secret for you. The reason I put in that bed, it's a trick to hide errors. Really? <laughs> yeah, when there's strange spots where the sound drops out or other things like that. If you've got a base of sound underneath that, it masks those things and people don't notice them as much. The reason why I do that every time is just to avoid any of those problems. Wait, see, you were always the guy to go to when I was in school for editing. Mm -hmm. And I remember you would tell me that there were certain nitpicky guys who would just be like, no, this and this and that needs to be changed. And this sound is louder and that part is – and he needs to say it a moment, like a three quarters of a second earlier and three all that. frames. And you'd be like, <laughs> I've already spent six hours working on this. It seems that that has continued on even into now with the Dune Steve. But you don't mind so much. You, you enjoy <laughs> – OK. If the good fairy came to you and said, hey, sailor, I will allow you – to never have to edit an episode again, I will do it from now on. Would you accept that? Or is it, I don't know, creatively fulfilling to you? It is. You know, I don't know that I would accept that. I would say, hey, how about you edit most of them and leave some for me or something? I don't know. You know, when it comes down to it, the whole reason that I felt driven to do this podcast is people like you and I and people that are creative types – they have to do something creative to feel satisfied, to be happy in their lives, you know. And we can't all do that kind of stuff for a living just because there's only so much room out there for that kind of stuff. And I, I have a job that's sort of creative, but not really. For the most part, it's like assembling toothbrushes or it's it's like... I. I'm Charlie Chaplin standing there with a wrench just tightening the bolts as they go past on the conveyor belt, really. And so I don't feel satisfied if I don't do something creative. And so that's one of the reasons I felt drawn towards doing this podcast is I just wanted to do something creative. And since I'm so lazy that I wouldn't get off my butt and actually write, 
I went to school for film because I thought that that would be something creative that I'd like to do. And uh, this is one step short of film. I mean, we're basically creating a movie except for without the pictures. We're creating movies for the blind. Yes. Kind of stuff. So I don't think I would want to give it up completely. It does use up a, an awful lot of time. So I don't know what the best way to deal with it is. And I guess we could throw this out to our listeners if there's anybody out there. You know, we always call for volunteers on our show. Maybe we do it too often. I don't know. Sometimes I get the feeling like we're the uh, Sally Struthers or something. Um, at the, please uh, <laughs> give so many children are in we're fact just like endlessly me. Asking and they need for help. help. Your, your donors <laughs> donate children. I'm afraid to do it again, but you know, if anybody out there is creatively driven like I am or or like Rish is, if you would like to get involved with the show, we're actually considering having people be a producer of sorts. Associate producer. No, they'd be producers and we'd be executive producers. Ah. All right. So basically, uh, yeah, you would produce an episode. You would be in charge of putting an episode together. And it would be a way to exercise your creative muscles without having to overwhelm yourself and have to have a show out every week. You don't have to have your own podcast. You could be a producer uh, with us and you could put together an episode once a month or once every other month. If people would do that, that would really be interesting to come to it fresh. I mean, we would experience what the listener yeah. does. Yeah, that would be cool. Uh, except for we would talk about it on the air and you listeners talk about it with, I, I suppose you have lovers. I, I, I've read of such things. Anyways, you would be a producer. You could pick the story that you wanted to uh, do. Rish and I would, of course, have to approve because we are the executive producers. And then you could take that story and find the voices that you want to play it. Go all the way through it from start to finish. Most of it is easy, except either you would have to know how to edit or you would have to know somebody who does know how to edit that could help you with it so that it could all be put together in the end. But yeah, it would give you a chance to be creative and to uh, have a podcast without having to go through all the work. Well, maybe that's not the right word. It, it is the right word, though. I've experienced it. You've experienced it. It, it. it is work. Well, hopefully, if you're just a listener, you don't think about it. Like you said about right. the background noise and all that. You just take it in and go, wow, that was really easy. Those guys sure talked a lot afterwards, darn it. But they have no idea that we actually talked for an hour and 47 minutes. And I hacked and slashed to get it down to 30 or whatever it is. Uh -huh. Give them the email address. For if if they'd like to be an associate producer, I'm not willing <laughs> you to. Won't call them a producer, I'm not huh? willing to promote them to producer yet. <laughs> All right, if you want to be an associate producer, yeah, just send us an email at editor at doonsteve.com. Let us know that you're interested. And Big will explain in better detail if if you're one of those people. Uh, for everybody else, just give us a comment on the blog about sound effects. What your thoughts are? Yeah, because you know what, if you don't appreciate them. If if they detract from the story, yeah, that then we be the can case. cut way back, and you know, hey, less work for us. <laughs> well, okay, I'm sorry, less work for Big, because <laughs> I I just lay there. So uh, interesting thing happened recently. Rish's favorite person in the universe contacted him. <laughs> yes, I answered the phone, and Sean Connery was there, and he said, oh. "Rish, my boy." No, Rish. actually, it was Norm Sherman. So Rish got a chance to do some lines for a Drabblecast, and it looks like that Drabblecast is available to download now. What is, what is this uh, story that you did? It was called The End of the Universe by Yuji Foster. Oh, cool. And it was an actual story. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Wow. Hey, well, yeah, if you're a regular Drabblecast listener, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, and the reason that it's me is because you were in Canada. Ah, that's right. Partying it up. Oh, oh yes, we were. The 22 degrees there. <laughs> Ooh. There, yeah, I think we were uh, burning our effigies of Guy Fox on that day. So it was fun to be had. Wait, isn't that November? I don't know when it is. And I don't know. I don't think they actually do it in Canada either. That's, they, they do everything. They, I, they, they copy do. anything the Brits do. Yeah, <laughs> so check that out. Enjoy yourself. I know I did. You haven't even heard it. <laughs> All right, so the big moment has come. Last week, we told everybody we'd let them know who won the contest. So... Wait, wait, wait. You're thinking that someone cares? I don't know. Well, we told them, so we might as well at least say... 
there was like five people that sent in their guesses for the thing, so we ought to at least let them know. Okay. For four of you five people, you didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> no, our, our listener Mario uh, is the winner, and well, I believe there are 25. He got all 25. So not only is this guy defeated Donkey Kong and saved the princess, but he knew all of those movie quotes. Yeah, that was pretty impressive. Good job, Mario. Nice work. So uh, moving on. Yeah, it turns out I had a pretty eventful week myself. I lost one of my fingers this week. You know, I, I noticed that. I was kind of – I didn't want to point yeah. it out. Well, it's a, it's a really interesting story. Um, oh, wait, wait, wait. Before you tell that, I, I thought it was fun just listening to us give the movie quotes back and forth. And when we actually aired the episode, I cut out all of the superfluous stuff. Isn't that a hard word, superfluous? <laughs> A little bit. I think I called it superfluous from uh, yeah. the stand, you know, the superflu that killed everybody. I had a friend so who said superfluous all the time. Silly. But if you don't mind, can we just pop that on here? Us doing the movie trivia questions and the well, answers? Okay, I guess. Yeah, that'll be cool because uh, one of our uh, listeners who submitted their guesses, he said, yeah, make sure when you're done with this, you don't just leave us hanging. Fill us in. Put it on your website or something. I guess this is a good way to let everybody know what the answers to the uh, quiz are. Hey, Big. Yeah? I told you not to drag poor Marcus into all this. <laughs> Come on. Let's hear it. I can't do that. I want to hear you say it. Can't do it, Connery, though. I'm terrible. Come on. Come on. I thought I told you not to drag poor Marcus into all this. <laughs> all right. So thank you for, for indulging me. Yeah, and yeah. I'll tell you what. The, the, the next time we do a quotes thing... You can be in charge. Okay. The, 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 the time after the next time we do a quotes thing, you can do it. All right? Okay. Okay. Someday I'm going to let you be in charge. What do you say? All right. That all sounds right. good. Roll okay. tomorrow, 8 t Yeah, 8 t Roll that. Okay. So I'll go first. Okay. Number one. Let me guess. Laundry day. Nothing clean, right? That one doesn't sound familiar to me. What is it? Let me guess. Laundry day. Nothing clean, right? Nothing clean, right? Is it Terminator uh, 1 or 2? It's got to be 1 because I don't know it well enough. Correct. Oh, we're doing that too, huh? Where we act it out and we don't act it out? I don't know. It's too easy if you act it out. Okay, number two. Here's mine. What on earth is this thing I'm wearing? Uh, th this, this is a radiation suit. Radiation suit? Of course. Because of the fallout from the atomic wars. That's Doc Brown seeing himself on the television. Right. Um, but but I, I have no idea what movie that would be. <laughs> okay. Uh, number three. Get busy living or get busy dying. That's damn right. Is that Serenity? Get busy living or get busy oh, dying. That's, that's what damn it is. right. It's uh, Shawshank Redemption. Doesn't that make all the difference in the world is doing his Yeah, voice? it does. It does, totally. Makes it a lot harder to not do it with the voice. Okay, here's mine. Number four. That's a dorky-looking helmet. What's it for? This dorky-looking helmet is the only thing that's going to protect me from the real bad guys. Should I do it in the voice? I, I, I'm trying to identify which one it is. The real bad guys. That's got to be the second one. Yep. Yeah, I want to hear your voice. Okay, I'll try. It's a dorky-looking helmet. What's it for? This dorky-looking helmet is the only thing that's going to protect me from the real bad guys. That was pretty bad. Sorry. Uh, that's X-Men 2 X-Men United? Is that what they call it? No. I think it's X2 X-Men United. United. Oh. <laughs> Wasn't that irritating? They called it X2. I don't mind it. I think it's cool. Well, you suck. It's kind of a lame subtitle. Might have been better if they just called it X Men United or something. I think so too, yeah. Better than calling it X Men 2. I I'm not a big fan of the whatever 2. I I'm much more of a fan of like Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone or Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom or the Matrix Revolutions. Yeah, I am too. That kind of a thing instead of just Spider Man 2. Yeah, they, they totally dropped the ball on those Spider-Man movies. Or whatever. Number five. A naked American man stole my balloons. That sounds familiar. Would I even know this one? I wouldn't. Well, then. A naked American man stole my balloons. 
It doesn't help with a little British <laughs> What is it? That's American Werewolf in London. Ah, uh, so I wouldn't know that. Gosh, that's a great line. You need to hold your mic up. I'm not getting you much. Number six. Morning, Colonel. Change your mind about that bottle? I want 600 pairs of shoes and 1,200 pairs of socks. And anything else you've been holding out on us, you piece of rat filth? That does not sound at all familiar. Yeah, you probably won't know it. Let me see if I can do a uh, Matthew Broderick voice. I want 600 pairs of shoes and 1,200 pairs of socks. And anything else you've been holding out on us, you piece of rat filth? What is glory? You got it. If you hadn't said Matthew Broderick, I wouldn't. <laughs> Number seven. We need like one of those cool recorded Casey Kasem countdown kind of voices. Number seven. You had the countdown this week. <laughs> Number seven. Oh, well, I've got two sevens and two sevens beats a fresh. Is that Temple of Doom? Is that 16 Candles? No. Dang. I don't know. <laughs> Look, I have, I have fresh. Oh. Well, I got two sevens, and that beats a fresh. Oh, is that Rush Hour? <laughs> no. Dang! What is it? It's uh, Revenge of the Nerds. Ah, oh, I needed just one more movie with a stereotypical <laughs> oriental, uh, sorry, Asian what voice. What sucks is he takes his money, and, and then Takashi goes, thank you, to him. It's just this <laughs> the meanest thing. He took his money, he says, thank you. Number eight... Big Anklevich coast to coast. Hi there, from my neck of the woods, eh? Sorry if I took a snap at you one time. Fish gotta swim, birds gotta eat. Without the accent, I wouldn't have got it. That's Finding Nemo. <laughs> yep. Number nine. Number nine. You know, that was the time I was most frightened. Waiting for my turn. I'll never put on a life jacket again. That's Jaws, isn't it? Nice! Was, Good job. The first thing that came to my mind just because the life jacket is Titanic, and I was just like, no, that's not Titanic. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that was when he's telling the story about the sharks eating all the... Okay, what are we on, number 10? Yes. Wow, number 10. Number 10. Please, this is supposed to be a happy occasion. Let's not bicker and argue over who killed who. <laughs> we do it once accent. Please, this is supposed to be a happy occasion. Let's not bicker and argue over who killed who. Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Yeah. I wanted to do it, but I tried to find at least one that wasn't totally obvious. But obvious, it didn't work so well with you, but I don't know. Well, yeah, I, I, there are, are some where it would be really easy to just pick, you know, E.T. phone home. <laughs> and you're just like, huh, I wonder what movie that could be. All right. You're not going to get this one. Number 11. Live for nothing or die for something. Your call. I don't know what it's like. Let's see if I can do it. A good Stallone. Live for nothing or die for something. Your call. Uh, is it Rambo 4 or 5 or whatever the heck they're on? It is 4. Good job. Awesome. Hey, it's a good movie. I just saw it again. <laughs> That's why I put it on. All right. Well, oh, number 12. Dear Buddha, please bring me a pony and a plastic rocket. Oh, uh, that's so cool. <laughs> Ow, what are you doing here? <laughs> I'm rescuing you. You'd be stupid enough to actually come here. That Serenity, oh boy, wouldn't it be great if we were on our third or fourth Serenity movie by now? <laughs> I suppose you could say that. Okay, this one you will get. Number 13. You once called me a warped, frustrated old man. But what are you but a warped, frustrated young man? Darn, I'm not... It's not coming to me. You once called me a warped, frustrated old man. But what are you but a warped, frustrated young man? I should get it, though, right? I thought so, but maybe the movie's not beloved to you. Like it is to so many other Americans. Dirty, dirty Americans. Oh God, book two. Nice! <laughs> no, it's a... What is it? It's a Wonderful Life. Oh, dang. Dang, it sounded familiar. <sighs> it is very beloved to me. If and I had said, well, you're, you're nothing but a warm, frustrated old man, would you have gotten it? 
Yeah, well, that's pretty easy once you do the Jimmy Stewart. Okay. Number 14. Baby talk? That's not a saying. Oh, but baby fish mouth is sweeping the nation. <laughs> I love that line. <laughs> baby. B- b- baby spitting up. Exorcist baby. <laughs> uh, uh, well. Yes, sir. That's my baby. No, sir. Don't, <laughs> don't mean baby. baby. If anybody is hearing this, they're thinking, wow, these guys suck. <laughs> and how right they are. Yeah. That is uh, When Harry Met Sally. Very good. Number 15. Here in town, there's only she who is beautiful as me. Oh, that's Beauty and the Beast. Okay. Number 16. Incidentally, my dear, he amuses me too. Bravo! Bravo! Yes. I would never have gotten it without that uh, wonderful accent. Uh, I'm going to say Disney's Robin Hood. That's right. Probably the movie that I've quoted most in my lifetime because I believe that was the first VHS tape my family ever owned when I was like eight or so. Number 17. Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. Moonstruck. <laughs> what is it? That's from The Godfather. Oh, see, I still have yet to see that. I, Shameful man. I don't know if you'd like it or not, but yeah, I didn't see it until I, I was in college, and I was just like, wow, this movie is good, and I love it more every time I see it. So. Oh, I'm sure that I would like it too, but I just haven't seen it. Okay, I'll see it. Oh, wait, that's not one of them. Okay. Presenting the high ridinous cowboy around... You forgot rootin' tootin'est, the high ridinest rootin' tootin'est cowboy of all time. W- Woody? Sheriff Woody. Sheriff Woody. Uh, I, my guess is that's Toy Story 1. That's Toy Story 2. I see, I don't know. Toy Story 2. That's Jesse saying that line. That uh, gives it away for you. God, I hate Jesse. <laughs> it's the vilest of all. You forgot rootin' tootin'est. I like Randall from uh, Monsters, Inc. more than Jesse. (laughs) Number 19. There's nothing more exhilarating than pointing out the shortcomings of others, is there? These are hard. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's okay. Plus, it gives everybody uh, something to shoot for. That's from Clerks. Ah, see, I've never seen Clerks. That makes it even harder. I bet you've seen this one, though. Why do you wear a mask? Were you burned by acid or something like that? No, it's just they're terribly comfortable. I think everyone will be wearing them in the future. You're going to give that whole line? Yeah. All right. Or I can do this. Why you wear a mask? Were you burned by acid or something like that? No, it's just that they're terribly comfortable. I, I think everyone will be wearing them in the future. I think a lot of people like the Princess Bride now. It's not just us. That's good. Number 21. 21. Somebody blows their nose and you want to keep it? You know I know this one. I'm trying to think of it, though. I believe Bill Murray read the line. Still not getting it. I don't know. What about Bob? <laughs> Ghostbusters. Ah. I suck. Sorry. It's all right. Okay. My last one, number 20. 22. 22. It's I want to rock and roll all night and party every day. No, I, I like to rock and roll all night and part of every day. I usually have errands. I can only rock from like one to three. Okay, now that sounds familiar, but it's not. And part of every day I have errands. <laughs> wow, you actually may have stumped me, dude. Yes! What was it? That was role models. Oh, shoot, that's brand new. So 20, 23, they made you feel cool. And hey, I met you. You are not cool. Don't know. Almost famous. Okay, go on. Okay. 24. You're the all singing, all dancing crap of the world. These are all movies you've not seen. <laughs> What is it? That would be Fight Club. Uh, and the last one, number 25, I believe. To her, it is simply another child. To us, 
it is the beast. Is that Rosemary's baby? Is that Damien? Wait, what is that one called? No. Is that your mom? No. I don't know it. Of course. Poltergeist. Ah. I've never seen that either. Oh, I should have done it in her voice. To her, it is simply another child. To us, it is the beast. Uh, Thanks for listening through the episode, if you have. If you're not one of the many who have already shut us off. If you have shut us off, free money. Here, I'll tell you the address of where it is. All right, so I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. Did we have a quote? Uh, We've done enough quotes today. Good night, folks. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. You may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. It's rare and expensive. The carapace is part of it. And if you suffer sudden decompensation, if you suffer decent compensation, if you suffer really quick poop, if you suffer decompression, session, and if you suffer, if you suffer sudden decompression, if you suffer suffering, if you suffer sudden decompensation, if you suffer in this, I've been drinking. Skin. Okay. <laughs> Peter snapped awake from a sweat-soaked nightmare. Peter snapped awake from a shit-soaked nightmare. <laughs> Peter looked at the chit in his hand. An animal had chat there. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs>